I have this memory. I'm in my great grandmother's bedroom in my grandmother's house in Roslindale, Massachusetts. The house is big and it's white. It has a, a big backyard and my great grandmother's room, uh, her name was Alma. Her room looks out onto the backyard and the detached garage, which is also behind the house. At the time, she was still alive, in her mid-80s, probably. I was in first grade, maybe a little bit younger. I'm standing in the middle of her room, which was small, or at least I, I remember it being small. This is, it's really the only memory that I have of that room. I have dozens of memories of the rest of the house, from the front door to the basement, about which I used to have terrible nightmares, to the attic, which was converted to a bedroom. I spent a lot of time up there playing video games, flipping through my aunt's old electronics and engineering textbooks, marveling at the inscrutable diagrams. But my great-grandmother's room, I didn't spend a lot of time in there. I peered in a lot. It was right next to the bathroom, but I rarely passed through the door. In this memory, though, I have. I'm not exactly sure why. And inside there's a small bed, a chair, lace curtains, I think, and a dresser. On the dresser is her jewelry, which is hazy. It's a, a background detail. It looks like it might be laid out very carefully. Which, I, I mean, I guess it makes sense. She was German. The top drawer of the dresser is open, and I've pulled something out of it. A small glass vial filled with tiny granules. This is the second clearest part of the memory. The vial itself. The granules inside. They're green. Or maybe the glass is green and very old. The glass of the vial is old and rough. I can tell that it's not a new thing. Eventually, in this memory, my grandmother, Virginia, Ginny, comes to get me. I have to put the vial down because it's smelling salts. But before she does, I turn the vial or I shake it. I'm not sure. And this is the clearest part of the memory, the sound of these granules inside this old vial, which I've extracted from the top drawer of my great-grandmother's dresser. Clarity and accuracy are different things. To say the sound of the smelling salts in their container is clear to me now says nothing about it in the room then. Now... The sound is light and crisp. It pairs well with the tactile sensation of the vial's contents shifting. But I can't say this is what it sounded like as it happened. Constantly passing over this memory has made it smooth, like stones in a riverbed. Echoic memory is what they call the buffer that allows you to understand words and sentences, among other things, audio. Echoic memory is small, it's short. Long echoic memory is on the order of a second, maybe two. It, it holds on to supercalifragilistic while I work my way through expialidocious. And three seconds after I start talking, the meaning extracted from my words has made it to your brain, but the memory of the sounds themselves has mostly dissipated. Past second four, how do we remember sounds? Well, most of us don't. Musicians, I've read, are likely able to. It's part of our training. We have slightly better, longer, echoic memory, but most others of us, most people, 
the things we see or touch or smell. We all know that one. A scent snapping you back to some long, unconsidered time and place. Input to those other senses is more likely remembered exponentially so than things heard. Those things are quickly forgotten. They quickly fade, as echoes do. I remember, or I think I remember, who knows, stones in a riverbed, the sound of the garage door opening in the house I grew up in. I went to public school in the suburbs of Boston until I was maybe 12 or 10. I would go to my grandmother's house after school where she would make sandwiches and I would occasionally look through my great-grandmother's things, apparently. But after that practice ended, I would go home if I wasn't at the library or in a theater society or lit mag meeting. Nerd. I'd watch MTV and play computer games. I have distinct memories of orange juice and hostess ding-dongs, watching Jamiroquai's music video for virtual insanity as often as it was aired, trying to figure out how they did it. I still don't really know. I mean, I, I know the floor moves, but the chairs, sometimes one moves, but the other doesn't. It, it, I just, I never got it. Anyways, I have memories of playing Hitman and Counter-Strike and Half-Life, and the sound of the garage door opening meant that it was the end of that unsupervised, unstructured time because it meant that my mother or father came home from work. It's a, it's a mechanical roar, this sound, a whirring, buzzing groan. Dull, because my room was two floors above the garage, but not quiet. The house would shake slightly from the vibrations of the motor. My parents called ours the house that Jack built in reference to Jack, the contractor who oversaw its construction in the late 80s and all of the shortcuts he took. Missing insulation here, crossed pipes there. Every time the house shook with the garage door opening, I would think, the house that Jack built. I remember when he was still alive, my childhood dog, Alex, would run to the door at the top of the stairs leading down to the garage when he heard the rumbling door opening. He was small, a Yorkie, very excitable, and he would get very upset when anyone left the house, so much so that there were strategies for closing the door if Alex was aware of your imminent departure. And he got very excited when anyone returned. And the garage door signaled return. Episodic memory is the memory of an experience of a time and a place subjectively held, that hike up the mountain when you were seven, walking through the cranberry bog when you were 13, last week at the bar when that guy tried to pick a fight with the bouncer. Semantic memory is the knowledge we build about the world, often through experiences which can become episodic memories. Semantic memory deals with mountains, episodic memory, that one mountain. Semantic memory, facts about cranberry bogs and walking through them. Episodic memory, that one day in Hyannis, in the bog, on the way to the candy shop. Semantic memory is that the loud, whirring, buzzing sound means someone is home. Episodic memory is that time dad came home with KFC. Episodic memory and semantic memory are intimately linked. They are mutually dependent and both heavily dependent upon one's culture. There are things we consider worth locking away. Culturally, we tend to emphasize the visual so it makes sense that our memories do the same. Episodic and semantic memory are also deeply embodied. There's clinical support for the claim that we construct more semantic memory when we are well, when our lives are stable and uninteresting, but more episodic memory when we are ill, when there is trauma or upheaval, which is cruel 
and is why I can revisit maybe a shred of memory, one snippet of one afternoon on the beach with my family as a kid, freeze frames from one or two discussions in college, or the first five somehow impossible but somehow carefree years I lived in New York. But in vivid detail, I can revisit my Aunt Phyllis in the hospital, the machines beeping and whirring, her labored breathing, and my family talking in the corner about all of the things you talk about when the last thing you want to talk about is really the only thing that anyone wants to talk about. And I can recall in smooth, polished, overproduced detail the crunching sound of the first car crash I was ever in. My girlfriend and I, who were fine, as was the other driver, shouting. I remember thinking how infernally satisfying that smashing sound was when it happened and how I would try to forget it, but I knew I never would. When a song is stuck in your head, it's not the sounds. It's all kinds of things. Rhythm, words, melody. Catchiness is not a sound, it's something else. Echoic memory plays a part in this process. Your short-term recollection of sounds cements additional content or meaning in your memory. That's how jingles work. Ba-da-da-da-da, I'm loving it. 800 588 Empire Today. Emotions, information, associations. But recalling it to yourself later, rarely will people recall the sounds they heard. Sound is the message, but it's not the meaning. Instead, it's the inner voice. It mimics or repeats what they heard or remember. It's a partial explanation for why listening to something stuck in your head is so satisfying. Though it's stuck in your head, you're not listening to it. You're always recreating it in your voice mentally. Externalization is like scratching an itch. So then what are you remembering, if not sounds? Maybe it's worth asking a question we've managed somehow to avoid unreasonably sound up until now. What is sound? We've talked about the physics, its waves, in a dispersive medium, but beyond that, what? Are sounds things, events, characteristics of objects, of the listener? The tree falling in the woods and my dog Jack both make but are not their sounds in the way a red pen is red or a book is paper. And the sounds you hear in your head, whether it's your inner voice recreating a jingle, some vivid memory of a sound from your past, or even tinnitus, or that thing where you think you heard your phone vibrate, but it didn't. Those aren't made of waves propagating through a media. So do they count as sound? There are many positions on what sound is. Too many to describe them all right now, but two philosophically meaningful takes describe a sound as properties or event-like individuals. If considered as properties, sounds can be taken as secondary qualities of objects, a characteristic of a thing received by our sense of hearing, something which doesn't exist outside of our perception of it. Color is another secondary quality, and some philosophers claim, relatedly, that it's actually more correct to say that something has a sound instead of saying it makes one. And another related concept, which I rather like, is that while sounds might be a property of the objects which have them, it is the dispersive media which reveals those sounds to us. So things still make, or I guess have, sound in a vacuum, but it's just not revealed to us. 
On the other hand, calling sounds event-like individuals means, first, that each sound is an event. It unfolds through time, and at no one moment during that unfolding is it complete or whole. A sound is more of a process than a thing. And second, it means that sounds, as events, have properties which can behave or progress independent of their sources. They are individual. They may mix together with other sounds, also individuals, change over time due to environmental conditions, but they exist as individual processes which we can mentally differentiate. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy gives the example of an ambulance siren. As it quickly drives past a listener, and there is the Doppler effect, we perceive the sound of that ambulance as having different characteristics at different times, but it's always the same sound, and it's acting independently of its source, which doesn't get smaller or bigger or lower or higher as the sound does. It remains the same ambulance. A poetically meaningful take likens sound to pain. A private experience located wherever those experiencing it happen to be. But the comparison falls apart, the theory goes, because pain is a bodily sensation, and we don't tend to appreciate sound that way, as a sensation. It may trigger or pair with other sensations, but sensation itself arguable. Still, though, as unlike as they may be, according to the theory, trying to remember sound is a lot like trying to remember pain. We can get really only part of the way there before our faculties dwindle. A sound is quickly forgotten if it's heard amongst other sounds. For echoic memory, there's something called the suffix effect. If information transmitted sonically is followed immediately by some meaningless or distracting noise, our echoic memory suffers. That's why jingles are always at the end of commercials. A cynic might say, those sounds are going to be forgotten anyway. A cynic might say, commercials don't end. There's always more commercials. It is presumptuous of McDonald's to think that its advertisement, singular and lonesome, would produce some kind of personal upheaval necessary to create an episodic memory. Like popular music, their game is repetition. You hear it over and over and over again, so it becomes semantic. Not one particular instance of the jingle, but the jingle in general. And this is how voice impressionists do it, too. The characteristics of famous voices become part of our semantic memory. So if the characteristics are imitated well, and the qualities are close enough, not too deep, high, fast, slow, smooth, or gruff, depending, the impression works. Impressionists don't capture the sound of the voice, but reference our always fading, echoic memory of it. Have you watched an old episode of SNL recently? Maybe one where Dana Carvey does his best George H.W. Bush or Sherry O'Terry doing Barbara Walters? Once ubiquitous figures whose voices have since evacuated public memory. The effect is surreal, nonsensical, even crass sometimes. A high order copy without original and to me at least exceptionally disquieting. But then Phil Hartman appears, not doing a voice, just as himself. And seeing him, hearing his voice again, a once ubiquitous figure, who has, regrettably, by and large, faded from popular experience, it's not so unnatural, but it is uneasy. I remember for a while... After my Aunt Priscilla died, her voice was still the one on the outgoing message on their answering machine. 
People would call and leave her messages. They would call and wish her a happy birthday or just to say hi, the way that we might do now on a Facebook profile, the way that I have done on a Facebook profile. But also just to listen. Calling and then leaving a message always felt compulsory to me. The message left was the follow-through, but not the aim of the action, which was just to hear Priscilla's voice again. The recorded voices of the departed become more like music, like a song stuck in your head. You can endlessly recreate it in your own inner voice, but it's not the sound that you possess, just some bits of information about it. A reconstruction. Except, in this case, unlike a song, externalization, listening to the real thing, or I guess a recording of it, can be less like scratching an itch, and more like wearing a hair shirt. The sound is the message, but not the meaning, and, for better or worse, will always be fading as echoes do. My name is Mike Rugnetta, and you can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at reasonably S N D. And you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr at Mike Rugnetta. <laughs>